Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the annual President's Town Hall. My name is Steve Klein. Uh, I work in marketing and communications. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Subra Suresh. Thank you. So I guess it's already afternoon. So good afternoon. Thank you, Steve. For all the cups. Um, fans out there. <laughs> as long as uh, Cleveland is beaten, I think people in Pittsburgh cheer for this. <laughs> so I'm reminded I have to start with my favorite philosopher's quote, Yogi Berra's quote. Uh, Yogi Berra, the baseball player, legend, and the famous American philosopher once said about winning, congratulations, I knew the record would stand until it was broken. <laughs> so congratulations to all the Cubs fans. So please, um, I'm really thrilled to welcome you to the annual Carnegie Mellon Town Hall. Uh, for those who are still standing, there are more seats here. Please come and uh, sit here. Since uh, coming to Carnegie Mellon, I pledge that we will maintain an open dialogue with students, faculty, staff, and alumni through a variety of forums. So even as we initiated a number of arranged opportunities, informal opportunities for this conversation through various events and forums, in addition to events that Mary and I hold at the residence throughout the year, this town hall is a great opportunity for all of us to come together, to share ideas, to give you an opportunity to ask questions to me, uh, share your thoughts, and equally provide insights and input that we can follow through during the year. Of course, the time is not enough to capture all of this input. That's why we have so many other opportunities. In true CMU fashion, this year, technology will play a major role, allowing even more people to participate. Students, faculty, staff, and alumni, and parents are encouraged to view our webcast or participate in the Q&A on Facebook Live and via the mobile app Slido, you'll see it on the screen, which you can find here. In fact, about 15 minutes ago, I was thrilled to see that there were already many people who are online, and uh, so some had submitted questions as well. So before I open the floor uh, for questions and discussion, I want to quickly update you on a few things. Just take a few minutes to give some opening remarks. First of all, I want to recognize uh, people who are contributing throughout the year and for a long period of time to this great university in so many different ways, visible and invisible ways. First of all, all of you who took the time from your busy schedules to come here. Uh, my wife, Mary, who's here. Members of the senior leadership team and the deans. Uh, vice provosts, uh, vice presidents. Represent representatives from the faculty senate and the student government. And students, faculty, staff, and alumni from our campuses around the world. There are three items that I want to quickly touch upon. All of them emanate from our strategic plan, 2025, which many of you so enthusiastically participated in, and we rolled it out just about a year ago. And many of you continue to engage in the implementation of that strategic plan. First and foremost, our desire to attract and retain out outstanding and diverse talent among faculty, students, and staff. In this effort, you received my email earlier this week announcing uh, the, board's, the Board of Trustees' endorsement to put in a significant fraction of the patent litigation settlement into the permanent endowment of the university to benefit long-term uh, how we engage our students, give access to our students, support our faculty and staff. So let me thank all of you 
for your for your efforts in contributing to this. Many people have contributed to this over many years. I won't individually thank them here, but uh, uh, you've had a series of communications to that effort. Through eight months of work, we had an ad hoc committee that engaged a number of colleagues, took 77 recommendations from across CMU, and found a remarkable consensus that the resources should benefit our university in a lasting way. Based on that consensus, the Board of Trustees endorsed investing more than 80% of the proceeds into the endowment and earmarking them specifically. I can use the word earmark here. When I was in the government, I was told not to use that <laughs> for obvious reasons. Undergraduate scholarships and graduate fellowships, faculty chairs, supporting ambitious research projects that make a real world impact, supporting professional development of staff and faculty. What's left will be devoted to, and what's left is not a trivial sum of money, that will be devoted to immediate needs in support of enhancing the CMU experience. Another new resource that will significantly enhance the CMU experience by capitalizing on our unique strength was what was announced yesterday morning through a new $10 million gift from the KNL Gates Foundation. It will establish an undergraduate scholarship, new faculty chairs, presidential fellowships for doctoral students, presidential scholarship for an undergraduate, an undergraduate student prize, and a biennial conference that will focus on something that CMU is very good at. CMU, many decades ago, pioneered the field of artificial intelligence. But as more and more of that is adopted by humanity on a global scale, we also face questions of ethics, how technology impacts the human behavior. And that's an area where, through work, not just in engineering and computer science, but equally in Dietrich College, Heinz College of Public Policy and Management, and EPP, and uh, business school and many other entities all across campus, we address these questions at the intersection of society, humanity, and uh, uh, technology. These enhancements and others we have already undertaken are already having an immediate effect on Carnegie Mellon. Most notably, in our ability to recruit and retain a diverse student body, faculty, and staff. Unless you've been hunkered down well inside the Hunt Library, or locked up in a research lab, or holed up in a rehearsal studio, or in your office, you will have heard that for the first time in Carnegie Mellon history, nearly half, 49.8% of this year's first year class are women students. Add to that, there are some amazing statistics, things that have bothered many people at the national level. There are some things that Carnegie Mellon is doing extremely well. There are amazing news about women in our class of 2020. While they make up about 16% of the first year computer science class in universities across the country, at CMU, Women first-year students make up 48%, three times the national average, thanks in large measure to a lot of very hard work by faculty, uh, leadership uh, in, in the School of Computer Science and across campus in the admissions office and so forth. My congratulations to them. And women make up about 20% of the first-year engineering class in universities across the U.S. At Carnegie Mellon this fall, 43% of the first year engineering class are women students, more than twice the national average. My congratulations to <laughs> colleagues in engineering. With the announcement of the recent endowment earlier this week, um, endowment added to support students 
from the Patton settlement, we also have this fall, the second cohort of presidential fellows and scholars. Currently, there are 255 students who, um, who receive the, either the presidential fellowship or a presidential scholarship. With the recent additions and recent gifts that we have received, the endowment, the permanent endowment that, is, that has been set aside just for presidential scholarships and fellowships has now grown in excess of $285 million just in a little over two years. So my thanks and congratulations to all of you. And 49% of presidential scholars and fellows are women students. So we, we have a little room to grow to, to reach parity there. My second update concerns another strategic plan uh, objective, which is enhancing the CMU experience. Just five days ago, we convened the first meeting of the President's Advisory Board for the CMU Experience. This external group of health, wellness, and higher education professionals are offering us their expertise on improving the academic and professional life of all CMU students, faculty, and staff. Uh, they, they, we put them to very hard work, uh, starting with the weekend and uh, will be receiving their formal input very shortly and will be taking actions on those inputs. You also heard that we took a step last semester adding round-the-clock access to universities counseling and psychological service services uh, known as CAP so that students who need to see a counselor will have the uh, access to do so uh, uh, round the clock. We've significantly increased the effort to do this. These, this external advisory board and other measures that have been taken will complement the very important work already underway by the internal task force for the CMU experience. That includes the leadership of the university, it includes um, uh, faculty, staff, and students, members of the faculty senate, and student government. And many of you have already taken note of our new first, uh, first day of class emphasis on informing students about campus support services. And this is just one of many, many steps that we will take, tactical and strategic, that will help improve the CMU experience. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was extremely pleased to see so many of you join us for an informal gathering at the fence to reflect on important issues facing our society. CMU faculty and staff are here to do all we can to facilitate these important dialogues. And various student leaders are helping make us aware of opportunities for university leadership and for faculty to con converse with student groups about events, big and small, and issues, big and small, that affect all of our lives, especially in this very troublesome election year. Enhancing the CMU experience also includes other efforts. It includes our commitment to make increases and improvements in the availability of childcare for faculty, staff, and graduate students, as expanded opportunities will come into existence just in a few months from now. We're also committed to creating a new health and wellness center by approximately early 2019, which will be nearly double the size of the current health and wellness center. This year, we are also piloting a new CMU host family program for international students. Such efforts complement the good work that Carnegie Mellon already does. As we speak, one of our most helpful community service projects, the CMU food drive, is underway across our campus. Last year's effort achieved record results raising $9,000 and more than 7,000 pounds of non-perishable items donated to the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank. With your help, we can eclipse that this year. So give all that you can, and please continue to participate in the many community service opportunities this university offers. The final item I wish to note is our recent hosting of President Barack Obama 
for the White House Frontiers Conference. Even if you are locked away in the library or anywhere else, it would have been hard for you to miss this. President Obama very deliberately chose Carnegie Mellon University and Pitt and the city of Pittsburgh for the final major conference of his presidency because of our comprehensive excellence and track record of technological innovation. His third visit to Carnegie Mellon during his tenure at the White House drew hundreds of science, technology, and policy thought leaders, as well as top local, state, and federal officials, which significantly amplified CMU's prestige around the country and around the world. So the events, such as the Washington Post news item about women in computer science and engineering, Uber affiliating with Carnegie Mellon and introducing their first driverless Uber in the city of Pittsburgh, the President's Frontier Conference have all brought global attention to Carnegie Mellon University. In fact, Steve Klein uh, informed me recently that the President's visit alone had more than one billion media impressions that mentioned Carnegie Mellon University. I think it's a record uh, uh, for, for any visit for, by anybody. So the President came to Carnegie Mellon because of your work, work that matters. So before I open the floor for questions and comments, I want to take this opportunity to applaud all of you, especially and the various groups that are represented here, the outstanding students, faculty, staff, and alumni. Some of you are also alumni here, who make Carnegie Mellon such an amazing university. I'll be very happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thanks so much, Subra. Um, as President mentioned, we're taking questions in four different ways to try to get as many voices in as we can. Um, we had several dozen questions submitted online in advance. Uh, we will take at least a couple of questions live here in the room. And we have Kate and Jen with microphones, so raise your hand if you find a break and see if you can get their attention and we'll try to get to you. Um, we also want to uh, First of all, welcome our Facebook live stream viewers. You have your own way to ask questions, which is in the comment field. Um, and finally, something new we're trying this year is uh, super mentioned Slido. You can go to this from your phone here in the room. You can go if you're watching the live stream um, from your office, but you can also join us because we have free refreshments here. Um, and it's easy to sign on. Use the town, word town hall as your code to get in. You click join event. One thing it doesn't say there, it will ask you a poll question when you sign on. We just wanted to get a sense of the affiliation of people who are tuned in. So it'll ask you if you're faculty, staff, or student. Um, so please help us with that. Um, and uh, obviously, this is going to be far more questions than we can answer in an hour. But we'll try to get a representation of different voices and different topics. And, uh, and then we will make sure that all of those questions are shared across the senior leadership team. So even if your question doesn't make it on to the live, doesn't make it on the air today, um, know that you're being heard and that we're talking about these things. So thanks again for your participation. Um, first question was submitted in advance by a staff member, Felicia Evans, who asks for a little more detail on what is being done to add diversity here at CMU. So one of the items that came through loud and clear in our strategic plan is a strong reinforcement of one of the fundamental values of the university, that we are a place where diversity of thought, racial diversity, gender diversity, and diversity of perspectives and ideas and opinions and lifestyles uh, are, should be cherished, cherished. So from a university's perspective, in terms of looking at our strategic plan for the next 10 years or so, there are many different things that come to mind. First and foremost, starting with me, diversity has to be a continuous pursuit for the leadership of the university. It also has to be a continuous pursuit for all of us. It's not just one person in one office who uh, recognizes the importance of this. In our daily actions, in the ways in which we treat one another, the respect we show for one another, the respect we show for different viewpoints while cherishing 
our freedom of expression, for which Carnegie Mellon was recognized as one of the top universities that values freedom of expression re recently in a national ranking. And so with all of this, I think there are specific steps that we can take, um, starting with the uh, administrative offices, for example, continuing to uh, reinforce the importance of diversity among our staff. In the academic units, as we look for excellence around the country, uh, how do we make sure that we attract the best and the brightest that represent different perspectives, different life experiences, and different viewpoints? Um, we need resources. In some areas, for some segments, uh, there is stiff competition on a global scale uh, for a limited pool of talent. We need resources for this. This is why we need presidential fellowships and scholarships, startup packages for faculty, uh, endowed chairs for junior faculty and senior faculty. Um, and, and the tone that we set, so uh, we recently started last year um, through uh, uh, one of the vice provosts, uh, Catherine Roder, looking at uh, sensitivity training um, for uh, faculty and staff. And I think this kind of activity can spread across, across the campus. So there are, it's not just one set of actions. It's not at one point in time. This is a continuous set of principles by which we live, uh, that we hold ourselves accountable at all layers of the organization, where we cherish the fundamental values of having a diverse and inclusive community where members of that community respect one another on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think... Uh, this is, uh, and there are specific metrics. This is not an easy issue. This is not an issue we can uh, address in one or two years in a complex organization like Carnegie Mellon University. But over a five to 10 year horizon, by all of us engaging in this, we can really move the needle. And we can also uh, put resources behind it. It's not just empty talk uh, and slogans. And this is why we want to make sure that we have adequate resources in our endowment to support these kinds of activities. Thank you. I um, want to make sure we leave time if there's a question live here in the hall. Any hands raised? I'm going to go to uh, Slido, where we have a number of questions. Thank you. Um, one that seems to be getting attention um, more than some of the others, and that's one of the fun things about Slido. We can tell who's giving it a thumbs up is a question regarding gender parity at the graduate level. Um, and Daniel Gingrich notes that uh, we aren't doing as well at the graduate level as the, the numbers we've been able to show this year with incoming undergraduates. What can we do in that realm? I think, you know, uh, it varies across the undergraduate student population. Uh, I, meant, I gave two examples of computer science and engineering. There are only limited examples. But if you look at the graduate student population, there is significant heterogeneity in the numbers of, uh, with respect to gender parity. Uh, if you look at some areas that I'm familiar with, if you look at areas such as biology, material science and engineering, and chemical engineering, typically in many of the leading research universities, you have more women graduate students than men graduate students. But there are other areas that are very few women graduate students. I don't know what the numbers are today, but a few years ago, areas such as computer science and mechanical engineering in most universities, uh, at national average, the number of women was rel uh, relatively small. So there is a significant um, um, disparity among disciplines, so we need to keep that in mind. Uh, and it varies dramatically even within, uh, within a college across departments. Um, having said that, I think just as in the case of the School of Computer Science, where the national average is not looking good, Carnegie Mellon, faculty uh, and staff and, and leadership took a proactive role in trying to fix the problem and show, um, take, a, take a national leadership role. This is something I think we can try to do across disciplines, uh, across many disciplines. And I think it it's needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. One of the ways in which we can address this in a very tangible way would be uh, making more resources available. For some of, some of you who are new to the university, uh, two years ago, when we looked at the numbers, there are approximately 2,000 PhD students on campus. Our ability, to, about a million dollars in endowment supports the tuition of one graduate student for one year, but in perpetuity. Uh, we had about $67 million in endowment, which will support 67 tuitions for 67 PhD students out of a population of 2,000 students. And we are now uh, 
uh, about $150 million or so with respect to our fellowship. That number needs to go to about a billion dollars. Then we will really see a big difference and we can effectively compete. So these are some of the mechanisms supporting young faculty and senior faculty with the flexibility to hire graduate students uh, who are highly qualified is another, area, another topic. Thank you. Another question submitted in advance is by a group of faculty members, um, and I know this has been a topic of interest um, throughout the fall, um, is about the wages um, for employees of CMU vendors. These are the people who work in food service and a variety of other uh, parts of the university who aren't employed technically by the university, but they're part of our daily lives. And as one questioner pointed out, often a first point of contact for students and others. Um, what can we do to ensure that, uh, that these employees are paid a living wage? So we have a, a, a number of employees of the university, but the university, like all organizations, also employs vendors who are not, th th those employees of the vendors are not employees of Carnegie Mellon University. But having said that, many of these people have worked for the university for a very, very long period of time. And um, uh, one of the things I think we need to do, especially at a time when there is a significant national conversation uh, about uh, disparity in income, uh, income inequality, and also uh, stag stagnating wages, especially uh, people who have to work two or three jobs, one of the things we can do as a university is to engage with our vendors in such a way that their employees, their practices, as they engage with Carnegie Mellon, are consistent with our values. If their values are not consistent with our values, I think we need to think through a process. And again, this is not instantaneous, this is not immediate. There are serious financial ramifications in a limited budget on how we balance this. So this is an important issue. And I, I want to share with you something that uh, really touched me. Um, about a couple of months ago, um, uh, Mary and I hosted a breakfast reception at the residence for about, uh, at 6 a.m. for the nighttime employees of Carnegie Mellon University. These are many of the custodial staff and there were also staff who have worked at the president's residence but who have never been inside the residence. So we invited about 150 of them to come for breakfast. And uh, we also hosted an event at the end of the day for the daytime employees. One thing that really moved me in this, so they worked from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. They left, their shift ends at 7 a.m. And specifically for this breakfast, we stopped their shift at 6 a.m and uh, had them come over to the residence. And I realized, and this is a national trend, I realized that I, we, we had wonderful food for them and uh, we asked some of them to stay as long as they wanted uh, because there was a lot of food left. And they said, no, we have to go because we have another job to go to. And one of the uh, employees, or one of the vendor's employees actually told me he didn't have the opportunity to go to university. He's determined to put his son to get a chemical engineering degree at one of the universities. Just, uh, you know, these are the kinds of things that bring you to tears. And uh, so th these are members of our community. Um, how do we address this given all the constraints and resource constraints that we have? And how do we engage with the vendors so that, um, so that we can, uh, um, over, over some reasonable period of time, make sure our values are consistent with this? So that would be my response. Great. Thank you very much. Um, here's a question that came over Slido uh, about an element of the lawsuit settlement proceeds that, uh, that you didn't address in your remarks, and that is specifically how they might benefit the College of Engineering. Kathy Bagaki, the um, questioner here is asking specifically about infrastructure. Will anything go toward engineering buildings and equipment? But I imagine there are others who want to know more broadly how this works. So uh, I can address that in two, three different ways. Um, of course, the invention that led to uh, the litigation settlement came out of the College of Engineering. So this is one of the reasons why it was important that the ad hoc committee that was chaired by the provost also included the dean of engineering so that he can represent uh, his faculty and staff and students uh, in the process itself. 
and this group met with a large group of cohorts. So based on recommendations from um, a wide cross-section of the community, based on conversations with faculty, students, staff, and alumni, and inventors, uh, and the trustees, um, this committee, the ad hoc committee, came to a unanimous consensus and recommendation that about one-third of the settlement go to benefit the College of Engineering. And um, uh, in terms of scholarships, fellowships, the other unanimous recommendation was also that a significant fraction of the resources that we set aside, not just for engineering, but for the whole university, go for the long-term benefit, that means endowment, not immediate expendable. So this will benefit the College of Engineering over a long period of time. And there are units within engineering, for example, the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department, uh, DSSC, the Digital uh, Data Storage System Center, DSSC, um, where, where the invention took place. So this is within the College of Engineering for these faculty and staff to work together. There was a question about buildings. Um, so this is one of the interesting things uh, to think about. Carnegie Mellon's endowment, uh, the university was founded in 1900. In 2012, which is just four years ago, our endowment reached a one billion mark. Okay? It took 112 years. Our goal is to bring the endowment from one billion to two billion in the next couple of years. So for a university of this size and this history, we cannot afford to have an endowment as small as this. We cannot rely on the federal government for continued support. Uh, we cannot rely on annual giving alone, especially if the economy tanks. So to the question about uh, buildings, we've been very fortunate to be right in the middle of perhaps the largest infrastructure expansion of the university in a five-year period uh, since its uh, inception. And we're doing the vast majority of it through fundraising. So when the Tepper Quad project, the largest building to come into existence, will be completed, we hope to do that without the need to borrow any funds at all for a $200 million building. So we need to balance those activities that require fundraising versus those activities, for example, supporting students through scholarships and fellowships, supporting faculty through endow endowments and chairs, et cetera, we need to have a good balance between endowment and expendable. And because our balance had not been uh, well balanced, if you will, um, we had to address that issue. And that's why there was a unanimous recommendation uh, to put a significant uh, resources from the settlement into our endowment to benefit the students and faculty and staff for the long haul. Wonderful, thanks. Questions in the room? Oh, it's, there's a live question. Some years ago, we had a speaker come to our university and give a talk in the evening in which he explained that he had done anonymous surveys of college student teaching and found very large fractions of the students at some institutions he named who admitted anonymously to cheating. He did not give any numbers for Carnegie Mellon. I think he didn't want to be undiplomatic. But if I sort of inferred from what he'd said that we probably, too, have a serious problem. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yes. So let me first and say we have phenomenal cohort of students uh, at Carnegie Mellon University. Equally, we have a very rigorous process of addressing departures from ideal behavior. <laughs> And uh, uh, it, it's, each case is different, and I think uh, it's very important that we look at the bigger picture, uh, specific cases, look at the details underlying it, and I think this is why uh, in, the, in the few years that I've been here on this campus, and in general, being in academia for more than 35 years, looking, dealing with uh, thousands and thousands of students, I've come to understand that uh, we cannot generalize for all students and we have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. If you look at large numbers, uh, our student population um, is truly wonderful. Having had, having had academic tenure in 
uh, more than uh, uh, two institutions, actually three institutions, three very different institutions, I would say we are so fortunate to have the kind of faculty and students we have at Carnegie Mellon University. Thank you very much. Um, let me take a question submitted in advance by one of our alums, Jesse Horan. How does CMU plan to improve its US News and World Report rankings and generate more media coverage? Great. Rankings are very important, but if rankings is our goal, we are not uh, doing a good job. Uh, uh, I think ranking is, uh, is an end to a journey, not the goalpost that we uh, tr try to see seek. Um, I think there are several things we can do. The priorities of the, the three priorities that are the overarching priorities of Carnegie Mellon University that you have articulated in our strategic plan, which encompass 24 different action items which are on the website. Those three are attracting and retaining top and diverse talent, enriching the CMU experience, and enabling uniformity of excellence across campus. If we succeed in all three, rankings will follow. In addition to that, if we can get presidents of the university, one billion impressions on global media, get the CMU name out around the world, and not be a stealth institution, that will increase the rankings. The students are very passionate. We have a new advancement group, uh, which is very passionate, led by Scott Mori, who joined us about a year ago. And this group, and as well as student leaders, are very passionate about uh, advancement and cultivating a culture of giving to the university. And if we succeed in this in the next 10 years, much more so than our history has indicated, then that will add to uh, our ranking. So there are so many different things. New facilities, new buildings, new labs, new makers wing, new nanofabrication facilities, brain hub, um, Science at CMU, there are many, many things that can improve the overall quality and attract top talent. So I think it's, uh, while rankings are important, and we need to pay attention, rankings uh, are, are not the ones we pursue for the sake of ranking. Some universities try to do this, but I think Carnegie Mellon uh, has a level of um, uh, distinction and um, uh, academic sophistication that it seeks quality and excellence rather than rankings. And I think ranking should be a byproduct of that uh, pursuit of excellence and quality. Thank you. Um, our Slido uh, audience seems to be coalescing behind this question related to the CMU experience. Does CMU have any concrete plans to change curriculum and deal with stress-related issues among students? So. Uh, Changing the curriculum as a, a university president, I would not want to get into the middle of, I, that should be done by the faculty. And faculty should be in charge of changing the curriculum. But having said that, um, it's very important. Um, uh, I, I have to point out that uh, the task force, the internal task force led by our provost is very much looking at academic matters. In fact, so many faculty are very passionate about uh, uh, what causes stress. I mean, we don't want to lose academic rigor. Um, but just having academic rigor doesn't mean it has to be stressful. So how do we balance the excellence for which Carnegie Mellon is known for with a culture where in reality and in perception, um, students and faculty and staff don't feel stressed out? I think this is important. Uh, do you need? 15 hours of homework to be excellent. Can you do that with 12 hours of homework per subject for three subjects or four subjects? Uh, this is up to the faculty to decide. I think this is very much part and parcel of the conversation that the internal task force uh, is looking at. I think uh, input from students and faculty will be very critical to this. We can do some other things. This is why the Health and Wellness Center in terms of counseling, um, uh, time management, both for for all of us, especially me, uh, and, and many others. How do, we, how do we manage our time most effectively? So rather than trying quantifying success on the basis of how many things you do, maybe peak performance is a metric. Whatever you do, your peak performance is what uh, makes you successful in your own definition, in your own mind. So I think how do we get uh, 
uh, how do we provide the support infrastructure uh, that will make it conducive for, for people to achieve their best potential uh, without being stressed out. I think that, that's part of the goal, uh, including in academic side. Absolutely. Any questions here in the room? We've got a couple up front here. Hold on just a moment and we'll get you a microphone so we can all hear it. <laughs> so I, the perspective you have is not something that I have because I was not on earth when you came to Carnegie Tech. <laughs> uh, so I, I appreciate that perspective that I lack. So um, let, me, let me say a couple of things. Um, I think the, the president of the university at the time, the name of the university changed from Carnegie Tech or Carnegie University to Carnegie Mellon University was Guy Stever. And when he finished the job, it was such a massive effort. He left Carnegie Mellon University to become director of the National Science Foundation. I just want to remind you, I came the other way. <laughs> so, um, so j just a couple of, I think, change of name is not a trivial uh, consideration. Our undergraduate population, by every metric, the freshmen who entered Carnegie Mellon this semester is the best class ever. And every year it's getting better and better. And so we have 6,000 wonderful undergraduate students. We have 2,000 outstanding PhD students and the rest are master's students at Carnegie Mellon. And I think any change of flavor has to come from the entire community. And we have so many wonderful things and underway in terms of priorities and availability of time. Change of the designation of the university or its intellectual flavor uh, probably will not be on, I won't have the bandwidth to take on, given all the other important things that are there. But I think uh, looking at, uh, uh, the enormous strengths of the university and how to capture that strengths all, ac uh, all across the campus and elevate the university is something that, uh, uh, that's very much in the discussion of uh, our strategic plan and its implementation over the next several years. I'm going to take a question from our Facebook audience, um, which is one we've encountered before at, at gatherings like this, but I think it's important because it's, it's top of mind for so many of our students and families. And that is, uh, what uh, is CMU doing to address rising tuition costs? So, uh, a number of things. Um, uh, it's no secret that our tuition is among the highest uh, in the country. Um, and even though our living expenses for students are not close to the highest, they are still high. So the total package is quite high. And, uh, and our dependence on tuition for operating expenses is much more than the institutions with whom we compete. So put it another way, the institutions with, with which we compete for students and faculty at Carnegie Mellon have endowments which are nearly an order of magnitude greater than what we have. The institutes that have endowment comparable to our, ours are not our competitors at all, not, not our intellectual competitors. So that's the unusual position we are in. So what exactly can we do? First and foremost, 
our com commitment to attracting students, going back to sc endowed scholarships and fellowships, more and more students getting them. That will not only help attract top women students, it will help attract top underrepresented groups to come to Carnegie Mellon in a stiff competition where we are going after, every university is going, going after a limited pool of talent. Same with faculty. Um, so that's one part of it. There is another part of it. Um, we worked very hard for the incoming class this semester so that students who have demonstrated need, who are brilliant, who get admitted to Carnegie Mellon but cannot afford a Carnegie Mellon education, we made sure that we can find a pathway for them to come to Carnegie Mellon University. We have not publicized this, but the reason we cannot, uh, we are not in a position to make it a policy is we don't have the resources to make it possible for all such students. We have to start somewhere. You have to start in steps. And as we go through, um, as we look at uh, next few years, this is why endowment is so critical, so that we can give more scholarships, uh, increase our discount rate, uh, make it affordable for students to come. And you will see that. You've seen that in the last two, three years by a steady drumbeat of message that we have given. Uh, we are able to attract the kind of student. Persistence is another issue. Uh, through leadership from our um, campus affairs group, uh, Lisa Creek, Mike Murphy, and others, uh, we worked very hard uh, to make sure the persistence numbers increase, uh, supporting students, Pell Grant students, making sure this, this semester we have a little more than 10% of our incoming freshman class are students who are first in their family to go to college. We want to make sure that that number increases. Um, diversity. Um, Western Pennsylvania is the, the fastest growing demographic group in the country is the Hispanic population. And Western Pennsylvania doesn't have very much of that. So if you want to represent the national uh, 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 demographics, uh, we have strategic disadvantages because of our geography. How do we address this? How do we attract students who are brilliant but um, who will not come all the way to Pittsburgh? getting the word out of the Carnegie Mellon to the high schools so the top students can come here. The largest state, the state from which the largest number of students come to Carnegie Mellon this semester is not Pennsylvania, it's California. And it's all because of our weather. And <laughs> <laughs> Google came, why can't they come? So, so I think, uh, uh, so th th there is a lot of these things, but I think resources are a very important part of it. This is why Fundraising, focus on endowment, focus on scholarships and fellowships and professorships is so critical. We have time for just a couple more questions. So last call from the room. There's one way in back there if we're able to get a microphone there. Hi, I'm a first year's master's student in mechanical engineering. This is my first semester. And the only issue I have is I have only two more semesters to go. Wish I could have had more. Uh, but on a serious note... Um, you can always do a PhD, you know. Yeah. <laughs> on a serious note, I have only a spring semester, and most of the courses that I'm interested in f comes in spring. So if there could be any flexibility in extending a graduate program so that we could accommodate for an extra spring or an extra fall, that could help students, that would be great. Well, thank you for your question. I, I don't know the specifics of course offerings in mechanical engineering, even though all my degrees are in mechanical engineering. Uh, I, I, I wish I had the opportunity to take classes at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, someday I might. Uh, but uh, uh, I think it's, it's a question of uh, resources, uh, the number of topics that need to be covered. Our mechanical engineering department, in terms of faculty, is relatively small compared to mechanical engineering departments around the country with whom we compete. Uh, with a few faculty, we do extremely well. With a relatively fewer faculty compared to our peer institutions, we do extremely well. So I think uh, uh, it's a question of uh, supply and demand. Alan Robinson is your department head. The next time I see him, I will bring this up. The provost is here listening to you. And uh, uh, I, don't, I cannot promise anything because I don't know the, what, what perspectives they have. But this is something you should bring it up with, the, with your department. Thank you. You know, this uh. is, as we know. So Steve is from Chicago. 
as we know, November 3rd, 2016, is going to be one of the great days in sports history. So I think it's only fitting that we take one last question related to sports. And happily, we were obliged by not one, but three different badminton questions. So a badminton question. They all rev revolve around the, there's a serious note to this too, um, a number of students who love badminton, they're passionate about badminton, um, but they're having trouble finding the time um, in limited spaces on campus competing with others. You know something about badminton, don't you? So first of all, I want to applaud the students for thinking about physical fitness, which I wish I had time to think about more. And Mary keeps reminding me I should be thinking about that more and more as well. So, so that's the first thing. The second thing I want to share is uh, when I was a young assistant professor at Brown University, I used to play badminton with some of my graduate students uh, who were roughly within a year or two of my age at that time. And we used to go play every time. I got beaten so badly, it tarnished me forever. And I haven't played badminton in quite some time, so I applaud you for doing this. Maybe one of these days I'll pick up my racket, which I still have, and come and play a game with you to see uh, how rusted I am uh, with respect to badminton. But, but more seriously, I think um, um, I, I was just thinking about this uh, quickly. Uh, you, you caught me there because uh, of all the issues I had to think about this morning, I apologize, I have not thought about badminton. <laughs> and I haven't thought about it in quite some time. Uh, but uh, seriously, I think um, we are making, it, it won't be an immediate effect, but we are making a concerted effort, and I'll give you examples, a concerted effort in uh, uh, improving facilities that we have, not necessarily for badminton, but uh, for, for physical and athletic facility, physical fitness and athletic facilities in general. For example, last two, two to three years, we spent significant resources in creating the fitness facility in this uh, Cohen University Center. Year and a half from now, we'll have a new fitness center come into existence in the first building in Tepper Quad. And we are very fortunate to have, under the leadership of Josh Centaur, a wonderful cohort of student athletes uh, at Carnegie Mellon. In fact, in Division III athletics, I don't think any other university can claim as many nationally ranked athletes who are also 4.0 scholars as Carnegie Mellon can. And given that we have such wonderful students, it is important for us to make sure that they have decent facilities. So even though renovation of the Skibo gym is not immediately on our plan, there are lots of conversations taking place about how we can think about as a next priority because I'm told that it's one of the oldest um, athletic facilities uh, in a university. So this is something that we've had, we've been talking about for quite some time. So your point about badminton is well taken, but before we have a new badminton court, we may have a basketball court, we may have a tennis court, we don't know, but uh, fitness is very much on the radar screen and there are concrete steps that are being taken right now, one at a time, given our resource constraints. So thank you for your question. I think we can wrap it up then. If so I, um, I don't have anything more to add, but I, I, I think uh, we, we will have events like this periodically and I think, uh, all member, all my colleagues uh, of this leadership team, all the deans, we very much appreciate you taking the time from your busy schedules to join us. This is not the only forum and there is not enough time to talk about all the questions, but we really welcome your input. Even if we don't answer them, I can promise you that these questions will be discussed in our senior leadership team and appropriate divisions of the university will take them up for follow-up action. I would also encourage you to uh, reach out to leaders of your representative groups. If you're a student, to your student body president. In fact, uh, uh, Vasavi um, came to see me yesterday, and this is another wonderful thing about uh, Carnegie Mellon University compared to many other universities that I've been fortunate enough to be part of. She not only came to see me to talk about some issues, she actually brought me some food yesterday. <laughs> and I very much appreciated it. Actually, a type of food that I grew up with as a child. Uh, so, so I want to uh, I, I encourage you to reach out to um, uh, leadership of your group. Where if you're a staff member to the staff council, uh, if you're a faculty member to the department head dean or provost, 
Uh, and, but please don't hesitate to contact us. Your input is very critical, so please uh, help us uh, do a better job. Uh, so we very much welcome you uh, to join in this conversation, not just today, not just once a year, but continuously. Thank you so much. I want to th <laughs> just want to add my thanks to all of you for taking your lunch hours to spend time with us online or here in the room. Talking of adding thanks, even putting together, I, I didn't realize it until I came to this particular job. In different jobs, I recognized it to different ex extent. The people sitting over there and people who are sitting in various places here, they have spent so much time even organizing something like this, monitoring Facebook uh, input, uh, Slido, and other things. So let's give them a round of applause as well. Thank you. And please join me one more time in thanking President Suresh. Thank you.